And the serpent said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He's pretty crafty, isn't he? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, God, she took of the fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. The eyes of both of them were open. They, they knew they were naked. They were no longer innocent and pure before God. Over in uh, verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called out to man and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And boy, here it comes. Are you ready? That woman. The woman you gave to be with me. She gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Ooh. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Well, she's right. The serpent is a deceiver. And she ate. Now, how many are sinners in here? How many are perfect? Uh, how many are sinners again? So, help me out. It's Adam and Eve's fault that we're sinners, isn't it? Yes or no? Yes or no? It's their fault that we're sinners. The answer is no. They had free will. How many have free will in here? We have the same exact free will. We can look at the tree of life every second of every day and be blessed and purposed and protected and have peace and joy. Or we can turn our eyes to the tree of the knowledge of good versus evil, desire to maybe taste it, but reap the consequences, as did Adam and Eve. We've all done the same thing. Uh, my wife, Suzanne, and I are even sinners. Amen? Suzanne and I had uh, our own mistakes in, from adolescence, surely, into young adulthood. And when God brought us back together from our childhood years, we were both already on a journey of surrender back to God, a recovery journey. And then he brought us together to not only complete that journey, but work in recovery ministry to help others back out of this fall. Everything from the front of the Bible to the very back is about this problem, this free will problem, where we didn't just keep our eyes focused 100% on God, who just wanted to bless us. That's he wasn't going to prevent us from sinning. He said, please don't sin. Don't take your eyes off me. Don't put your eyes on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Please don't. But he didn't prevent us from it. He just desired that we wouldn't do that. He's holy. He wants us to be holy as he is holy. But he won't make us be holy. He desires us to want to be holy. And then we'll be blessed, guided, even used by him. Satan is unholy. There he was. He still is there. He still exists. Still deceiving, lying, tempting. He is unholy. He wants us to be unholy as he is unholy. But he can't make us be holy. He couldn't make Adam and Eve be unholy. He, he, he didn't make Rodney be unholy and make mistakes and become a sinner. I chose. I made bad choices. Free will. And we have that. Even Paul, 
Even Paul who wrote whatever, one half to two thirds of the New Testament said in the uh, seventh chapter of Romans, why do I do what I don't wanna do, what I know I shouldn't do? I don't understand this. That's a terrible paraphrase. But I know what I should do, but I just can't seem to get it done, at least consistently. Who will rescue me? Praise be to God for Jesus Christ, amen. And uh, he had already stated before that in the third chapter of Romans, all have sinned. And what? Fallen short of the glory of God. All of us, we know that. That's why we're here. But we need to be reminded of it. Life is tough. Life is hard. Uh, partly because of our sinful choices and then just trying to survive in a sinful world, a fallen world. It's not the Garden of Eden. It stopped being that. When first mom and dad chose poorly and then we continued to, and still do, unfortunately. But this is the answer, Jesus Christ, of course. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who shall ever should uh, believe on him shall be saved, amen. And uh, if we just confess with our tongue, believe and confess that we're sinners and ask forgiveness, we will be saved. It's, it's that simple. That's what this whole book is about. But life is hard and uh, coming to Jesus is important. That's the beginning, that's the foundation of our way back. And then uh, we study the word, we worship, we go to Sunday school, we keep uh, our eyes more and more focused on the author and perfecter of our faith and take this life journey. And uh, it's a pretty successful journey when Jesus is our true Lord and Savior. We truly have repented. Sometimes though, some of us face really challenging, daunting uh, results of the sin nature, both as victims, those that have victimized us in different ways, are as the victimizer, those we've victimized and hurt. And we probably all, if we're honest, could fit in both categories, from small ways to sometimes tragic, big ways. So that's why I want to talk just for about another five or 10 minutes, 10 probably, about a program that God called Suzanne and I to 20 years ago this month right here when Timothy introduced us to, yeah. We came here 20 years ago this month. Uh, God, God was leading us here. We knew it. Didn't know exactly why, but uh, we had been doing already recovery work out of our home with another program. And then we came here 20 years ago this month and Timothy said, ah, oh, I've been praying for God to send us a couple to do this new program called, relatively new program called Celebrate Recovery. Here's the kit, study it and pray over it. Let me know what you think. Well, we knew right then and there what, why God had brought us here. Long story short, as we studied it, we knew we were supposed to open up a chapter of this program, Celebrate Recovery here at the Rock Church and then just follow God's lead. And um, I've been privileged to do that, needless to say. Celebrate Recovery is an almost 30-year-old program that was developed by John Baker and his wife, Cheryl, who originally were from St. Louis area. He, Collinsville, and she, University City. But by the time they had married and moved to California to start his career, uh, his alcoholism began to gain a hold on him from college, the previous college years, and then certainly in his career, business career out in California. And he went through the AA thing for several years, but he felt he needed to come back to his true higher power, Jesus Christ. And by then they'd started attending Saddleback Church in California, Rick Warren's church. And together they knew God was leading them to build this Christ-centered Bible-based program of Celebrate Recovery. 30 people attended the first night. This was almost 30 years ago, 29, whatever. And uh, now it's a global phenomenon. I'll use that word. But ordained by God and controlled by God. It's a global, Christ-centered, Bible-based version of the 12 steps. The original 12 steps of AA, GA, NASA, all the A's of the 
more secular-based programs, which have done a good work. But this is a program, an alternative program for those who either are one need to take a recovery journey back to their Savior uh, because that's who they believe is their true higher power, or for seekers that want to know more about this God and this Savior on their 12-step journey. So I'd like to just read a paragraph or two and then make a few comments here just so you know a little bit more about the ministry here that Suzanne and I have uh, been involved in here as the point people, the facilitators at the Rock Church, also then combining uh, CR activities, Celebrate Recovery activities, citywide, statewide, um, as God continued to expand his program. So here's a little history. Celebrate Recovery is a Christ-centered, Bible-based program for anyone with hurts, hang-ups, or habits that interfere with their relationship with God or others. Uh, if that doesn't include any of you, I guess you can leave. <laughs> Nobody's leaving. Praise the Lord. Celebrate Recovery is a safe place. We support and encourage each other to learn and follow the 12 steps and also eight principles defined by the gospel. It's another version of the 12 steps based out of the uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and the, uh, the uh, help me out, Suzanne, the, the eight uh, Beatitudes. Thank you. Amen, Peggy. Through worship, personal sharing, and confession, listening to and praying for ourselves and one another, we open ourselves up to an experience of healing and growth that God has in mind for us, always did have in mind, instead of insisting on our own ineffective ways, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We accept accountability by sharing our own experience, strength, and hope in God, who loves us more than we ex ever expected in, and especially in Jesus who died to offer forgiveness that we do not deserve. And in the Holy Spirit who teaches us how to behave more like Jesus. If all your efforts to find comfort and freedom from pain in this life have not been successful or completely successful, and that includes a lot of Christian people, and it's led to more pain and emptiness, perhaps it's time to try something different. Please join us together as we pursue real life in Jesus Christ and celebrate recovery. And he's, he is the only one that can bring his people uh, through his word. Uh, here's a few of the things. Uh, traditionally, AA, the, the traditional model that developed back in the 40s was for alcoholics. Then came the Narcotics Anonymous. Then came the Sexual Addicts Anonymous. Then came the Gamblers Anonymous and all of these other Food Addictions Anonymous. So there's anonymous groups out there uh, using the AA model. Celebrate takes all of that and combines it all in one setting, and you can find a group in a CR setting. And here's just some of the issues we, we can offer up. Abandonment, rejection issues, manipulation, control, people-pleasing, dysfunctional families, adult children of dysfunctional families, anger, rage, Anxiety, panic, fear, insecurity. Here's an important one. Codependency and unhealthy relationships, enabling others. Divorce, marriage issues, depression, loss of hope, abuse issues. For a lot of people, that was childhood. Physical, sexual, emotional, other forms of neglect. Eating disorders, overeating, undereating. Gambling, grief, sadness, guilt, shame, obsessive compulsive behavior, overspending and financial loss, overworking, workaholism, perfectionism, and of course, again, the chemical dependency, alcohol, drugs, and certainly sexual addiction and gambling addictions. And the list really goes on from there. CR is an all-encompassing program that deals with all of those things. Now, a lot of us think, oh, none of those things bother me anymore. <laughs> I'm saved. I, I raise my family. I go to work. I got my 401k, getting ready to retire. I play golf. I work on the house. I do what my wife tells me to do, all the honeydew, on and on. But there's a lot of us 
that still have issues that were never completely resolved, never quite completely resolved, that affect our daily persona and characteristics and actions and reactions. If we're honest, we need to admit that. CR, again, is just a, a little bit shorter version and intense but effective version of the gospel of Jesus Christ for those that know they still have a hurt, a habit, a hang up in this life that's still affecting them from being the whole person, man or woman, a spouse, father, citizen, worker at the workplace, and being the real Christ-like example that we need to be. And so CR is for you if you sense that or for a family member uh, that may need CR. Uh, Suzanne and I are the, again the point people here and we attend a joint meeting on Friday nights out at E Free Church on Carmen Road where it's called the general meeting night where people would first come and begin to get engaged in CR, learn about CR, begin to learn how to open up this pain and shame that's never quite been resolved that's still affecting you. Hear testimonies and, and special instructions. And then later on, men and women are encouraged to sign up for what's called the step studies of CR, where a small group of men, a small group of women at different locations, we've used this one many times, for the step studies, that's the CR curriculum that you would work through with a group of men or a group of women. And really, once and for all, re-clarify what's still affecting you. Surrender it all, not just part, but finally all onto the altar of grace and healing and be changed, healed, and then repurposed in a different, uh, finally, a complete, not perfect, but a real, uh, complete Christ-like walk in this life till we reach perfection in our new body in heaven someday. To close, I'd just like to read the 12 steps of CR. And I, originally we were, no, so I'm just gonna read them, right? Okay. We were trying to find a way to pull them up on the screen, but if you'll just listen, I'm just going to close out the service by reading the CR, Christ-centered, 12 steps. Give a little comment. Step number one, and they're very similar to the original 12 steps. Step number one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and our compulsive behaviors and that our lives had become unmanageable. In a scripture, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. There's Paul again in Romans 7. So we have to admit, I still have a problem. Some of us, some people, I've got a big problem. I'm addicted. Or I have a terrible compulsive behavior. Others of us, I still have an issue that's affecting me. So that's step one. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose, Philippians 2. So we, we not only admit we have a problem, we know I'm not powerful enough to conquer this. Never was. My life proves it. Step three, so we made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, Romans 12. When he said, when it says in the steps, our lives and our wills, in CR we know that when we turn our life over to God, our higher power, that's our salvation experience. Whether we did it in childhood or adulthood, um, that's when we receive Christ as our Savior. We turn our life over to him. Turning our will over to him requires a lifelong journey, doesn't it? Amen. A lifelong journey. But we, we're doing that here. We do that here in our churches and, and our Sunday school and our Bible study and so forth. We're learning more and more to turn our wills. Again, this is a more intense uh, version of that same process for those that feel they need it. Now, here comes step four of the great 12 steps. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations, third chapter. And so men and women who are going through step studies especially get to a place where they use a format and some paperwork 
and they go back to the very beginning to the best of their ability, well, with God's help, and pull out all those issues that have still plagued them and still are plaguing them. And they, they uh, document that. And then step five comes along. We admitted to God, to ourselves, and other, to another human being the exact nature of our wrong. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And uh, so that other person, we're, we, we share our inventory with God who already knew it anyway and helped us formulate it. We admit it to ourselves, this is still plaguing me. And then we share it with a sponsor, that, a veteran recovery person who uh, needs to hear it and then pray it onto the altar of grace and healing with us. This is a monster uh, step forward in our recoveries, uh, steps four and five. Step six and seven are just further we were entirely ready now to have God remove all these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up, James 4. And then 7, we humbly ask him to remove all our shortcomings. And then this great verse, of course, from 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now the next two steps, another challenging time in the recovery journey, but so very important for complete healing and uh, restoration with God and others. Step eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. In that list also, we, we work on people who have harmed us and we become willing to forgive them. So the CR version is both being willing, when we make this list of people we've harmed, being willing to apologize the best of our ability Sometimes there's times when we never will be able to. They're either gone, we don't know how to find them, so we turn that over to God. Other times we will have direct, under God's leadership and timing, the opportunity to, to apologize for harm we've done in any way to our parents, our brothers and sisters, our spouses, our children, what, our workmates, whatever. And step nine, we may direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift on the altar, there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar and first go and be reconciled to your brother. Make amends and then come and offer your gift. We, we really don't want to just consider ourselves completely righteous and even righteous enough to come here and at the altar, now don't misunderstand that, but if we haven't really sought to make amends with those we've heard are forgiven those that have hurt us. And this is a real important step. It's a tough one, but with God's help and the uh, people walking beside you, the power of the Holy Spirit of God and Jesus, it can be done. And it is an amazing, healing, freeing event in a recovery person's life. And then the maintenance steps, we call them of CR come, 10, 11, and 12. 10, we continue to take personal inventory every day, every minute. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So if there's an event, we learn in recovery, if there's a, a new event that's happening that could become cancerous and ugly for years. We don't want to do that anymore. That's what we were making amends for. We want to admit it right away. Step back, take a breath. Say a prayer, God, what was my fault in this? And then go right back to that person and apologize for your part or, you know, make amends. So, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall, 1 Corinthians 10. Step 11 is real important. We all know this already in our Christian lives anyway. We sought through prayer and meditation and Bible study to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of His will for us, not ours anymore, and the power to carry his will out. Let the word of Christ dwell in it richly. CR definitely really uh, hits this heavy. You must have daily quiet time with God in the word and prayer and meditation and following thereby the lead of the Holy Spirit in all we do throughout the day, including again our actions and reactions to every situation, which are still gonna be tough at times. And then the great step 12, this is really important for recovery people, it's the give back step. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. 
Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted, Galatians 6. The enemy's never going to stop. He's never going to stop, is he? Now, we've got Jesus as our Savior, hopefully. We'll address that if you don't here in just a minute, but um, the enemy's never going to stop. But as we move down a journey, whether it's just only through our churches and Bible study and in, in our quiet time, and uh, that's good. That's important. Uh, the enemy has less and less opportunity. God builds a wall of protection more and more every day, every year, and he just finally reaches a point where he, he goes on to other places. And uh, that's what we're after here in our church lives, our Christian walk. But again, in 12-step Christian recovery, uh, it's an intense uh, emphasis uh, to get to this place where we intentionally every day are building, having God put another brick in the wall of protection around us against this enemy who's never going to quit until the day God puts him down once and for all. Now back to Genesis third chapter, God said, uh, told the serpent, you know, uh, her descendants, the descendants of Adam and Eve, they're going to be enemies of yours. Again, this is a terrible paraphrase. And you will, some, some, some uh, interpretations say bruise his heel, some say bite his heel. But then it says he will crush your head. And that he is Jesus, theologically. And he did that in two phases. One has been done and one yet to come. He died on the cross, but then God rose him from the grave. And, he, and Satan's head was crushed. Death no longer had its uh, victory over us that have come back to God through his saving son. And then part two of that final crushing of Satan's head and deceptions and lies that he's still trying to do, even to us, Christian people, as well as all of humanity, will be when Jesus returns. And uh, those that know Jesus will enter into the new heaven and the new earth, perfect joy and peace, and the enemies of God, both Satan, the demons and humans that have rejected, sadly, uh, their heads will be crushed in the pit of hell. Sickening. It's all about choice, free will. It always was. Have you used your free will to come back to Jesus as your Savior and begin a life journey of returning to the full, perfect purpose and design God always had for your life. I'm still on that journey. I don't, I'll never leave it. Praise God. And if you need a little more intense help on that journey with issues that have never quite been resolved, come see Suzanne and I right after the service. We'll give you some information. But in the meantime, I'd like to ask those who have never, if you know you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, your, uh, and by the way, worship team can come now. Timothy's better at the timing of all that. But if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, certainly it is our duty here to encourage you to pray about that and consider that and follow the Holy Spirit, hopefully. Right up this aisle, I'll pray with you. If you just have other hurts, hang-ups, and habits that you know still need to be dealt with, you can come pray over those. Uh, Suzanne and I will pray with you afterwards and give you, again, some information that just might help you more intensely on that journey. So uh, let's stand together and follow the Holy Spirit's lead here, please.